the support that I offer is quite bespoke to each family depending on their circumstances so some families maybe just check in with me every now and again um, sometimes I don't even meet the child sometimes it's just parental support uh, talking through different challenges and trying to unpick that with them but yeah it really varies and I love it I absolutely love my job actually I find it really therapeutic <laughs> it's quite nice to get out of the house for okay hopefully this is going to work for me ah I've gone too far okay so um I hate the term challenging behavior um, I must say anything behavior I struggle with and um, there's quite a lot of stigma attached to challenging behavior um, but I also appreciate as a parent that yes sometimes our children massively challenge us so um it's just I suppose making sure we frame that in a way so it isn't all put on the child that's what I feel uncomfortable with when all the responsibility is put on the child so I just wanted to bring this up because actually I thought it was really interesting as to the um, origins of oh I've just got a couple of people waiting in the waiting room I'm just going to let them in and make sure that they're muted hi I've just let a couple of you in can you just make sure that you're muted uh We've only just started, so you've, never really, you've really not missed much. Cool. So yeah, I just thought it was really important to talk about the origins of um, the term challenging behaviour, because actually it was a term that was brought about to try and um, ensure that service providers were changing how they do things, rather than it being something that we a term that we use to focus on the child and actually I only found this out recently myself so I was like oh actually that that puts quite a, a nice positive reframe on it for me it was aimed at service providers that were finding um, that they were having challenges in what they were offering and actually it was about them making the changes in order to support the children or young people or adults that were in their care Okay, so where are we? Defining challenging behavior. So actually I've used uh, Dr. Luke Bearden's um, definition of challenging behavior just because um, Dr. Luke Bearden is fantastic and I highly recommend anything um, by him. He's got a fantastic book on Amazon that's around seven pounds called Autism and Asperger's in Children. Uh, really easily, easily read. Um, and he's got another book coming out at the end of this year that talks about managing anxiety in autistic children. And actually, I, I've uh, had the privilege of having it to review and it's absolutely fantastic. So another really good one to keep your eye out for. I think December it comes out. So he's, you know, anything he does is just fantastic. Um, but it's talking about actually how do we define challenging behaviour? Um, and how do we look at that? So he's talked about it as being um, a risk of actual um, emotional or, or physical injury to others and self, um, which isn't in there, but, but I'm sure that's what he means. Um, if a behavior is breaking the law or if it leads to significant damage to property or major disruption to the environment. So, so I think for me, the important thing about this is that actually for a behavior to be deemed challenging it has to be really high level it can't just be those behaviors that actually maybe are just a bit difficult for us to uh, accept um, i suppose is the best term which I, I cover a little bit more so yeah cover that a bit more in the next slide so what causes challenging behaviors let me just have a sip So all of these are reasonably self-explanatory. Anxiety, overwhelm, all of these things massively overlap, um, but I felt that they needed to be put down. So anxiety, overwhelm from anxiety, overwhelm from sensory distress, um, differences in communicating. So if a child communicates in a different way to their caregiver, um, this can lead to frustration because they're misunderstood. Again, that can lead to anxiety um, and the overwhelm. Uh, difficulties in, in understanding and expressing emotions. And this is, um, and we go into all of these in more depth throughout the presentation, but this is probably the um, biggest area of work that I do when I'm working with children is actually 
working through emotions um we go on like an emotional journey uh of understanding and communicating um how they're feeling because that's such a massive part of um their experience and a massive part of their anxiety so it's uh it's quite a process to work through that with with families and and young people okay so cons really serious considerations um, I suppose the reason this needs to be brought up is because sometimes we might deem a behaviour challenging, but actually it doesn't fit that criteria. It doesn't truly fit that criteria. Uh, sometimes it's because maybe we're uncomfortable with other people's judgments of that behaviour. So, for example, if you've got a child that's squealing with excitement um, and, and you're uh, you know, you've got lots of people looking or uh, being quite judgmental about that, then actually is is that truly a challenging behavior who is that actually challenging actually maybe it's just challenging um the mindset of the people that are that are sort of rolling eyes giving dirty looks or whatever so the considerations is is anyone risk of harm is a child harming themselves or are they harming somebody else and we talked about physical and emotional harm uh, what is the child trying to communicate? This can be so difficult to work out sometimes, but, the, but all behaviour is communication. What is your child trying to tell you? Are they trying to tell you that they're severely distressed? Are they trying to tell you that there's something that they desperately, they desperately want to share with you? Uh, the function beneath the behaviour, so are they using it as a, I need to get out of here right now? Are they using it in order to um, self-preservate? and shut down um is intervention really necessary so how we talked about the the child that's screaming and screeching with excitement where does it where does the intervention lie surely the intervention needs to lie with the pe the onlookers um for it to be explained to them that actually my child's really happy and i'm not i'm not willing to 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 intervene with that because why would i um are they based on uh NT is neurotypical perspectives. So are we actually, again, not seeing through the eyes of the autistic experience? Are we not putting ourselves in the shoes of that autistic child to really truly understand um, what's going on for them? Are we judging behaviors on our, um, on neurotypical, I uh, can't think of the right word, but, Oh, are we really putting ourselves in their shoes and seeing life through their lens? That's really, really important. Uh, those who aren't autistic can find empathizing with autistic people really difficult. So, you know, there's this whole thing around autistic uh, people not having empathy, but actually sometimes there's real issues um, with it being the other way around and for, for neurotypical people to not truly understand the autistic experience and that's something we really need to grasp if we want to really support our child okay so we're going to look at those um causes of challenging behavior and we're going to see what we can do about some of them so decrease in anxiety so uh Autism doesn't necessarily mean anxiety or it shouldn't necessarily mean anxiety, but we know um, something, I think the, the research statistics are around 80% of um, autistic people will um, struggle with anxiety. I think it's probably um, maybe even higher than that. I think that's uh, somebody who would be deemed to have an anxiety disorder. So how can we support our children in just decrease in that general anxiety. So some of this, some of this is the basics, some of this you might know, but I feel like it's really important to emphasize it because sometimes we forget about those really easy quick fixes um, and we, we sort of forget to return to them regularly. So making life predictable is really, really important. So for an autistic child, the world is quite a big, scary place. It's so unpredictable. There's unpredictable sensory input, there's unpredictable people, uh, there's, just so many unpredictable scenarios. So if we can make life as predictable as possible, that can be really, really helpful in managing anxiety. Now this can look different depending on the child. So if we talk about, okay, let's talk about a day out to the beach. Some children might just need to know um, where they're going to, uh, what they're gonna be doing there and what time they're coming home. 
some children might need to know what time they need to get up in the morning, what they're going to be wearing that day, how long they're going to be in the car for, exactly what's going to be in their picnic, where are the toilets going to be when they arrive, um, how long will they be spending there, who else might be there, who else is going to be with them, they might need to see pictures of the exact beach that they're going to. So, you know, you're the experts in your children, you will know what level of input that they need to, um, that you need to provide with them to just try and manage that anxiety. And a really nice thing as well about is, is having this sort of um, timetable. And I always um, suggest to parents doing visually using pictures and Google images is fantastic for that sort of stuff now, is that you can, talk through each part of the day with your child you can um you can do that visually you can do that uh, using very simple emotion cards to just find out what it is about the day that is causing them the most um the most anxiety so is it the journey like my daughter absolutely hates car journey she really really struggles in the car to the point where actually she wouldn't go anywhere just because of the difficulties in the car but it took us a while to realize that that was why she was refusing to go anywhere um just because the car journey is so difficult so we have to really over plan the car journey for her uh, and we have to make that really predictable by you know she's always got access to the sat nav right in front of us as you can see where we are and how much further we've got to go and how long that's likely to take and if there's traffic up upcoming um so it's a really nice way to yeah really work out what's going on for your child working out where um the anxiety lies and just making things go as smoothly as possible routine so i've got a sort of a small visual here that i did for my facebook page um around routines um that i produced actually at the beginning of lockdown because we were finding it really difficult at home i was working with lots of families that are finding it really really difficult so routine offers um a level of predictability and these don't need to be visual timetables like they are in school just that certain things happen at certain times every day so for example in our house we have um routines around uh electronic devices so and that's just that's just a consistent rigid these are the times that you go on your devices these are the times where you you have access to them and, and if we're going out for the day, then it means that maybe they take them in the car for that period of time. Um, but but we keep we try and keep that as rigid as possible. We in lockdown, we got into a very rigid routine of at three o'clock. We always had tea and cake or a bit of a treat. Um, and we all sort of sat together and, and had something nice to eat. And we, actually, we still continue that now, even though we're slightly out of lockdown um, every day at three o'clock, you know, you know they've got access to whatever treat they like out you know an ice lolly or a bit of chocolate or whatever it is um so actually offering those routines those uh family structures can be really really helpful to a lot of children uh just and there's a few examples there you know about consistent movie nights or uh and you know initially you can initially it might be helpful for your child to see that visually so it might be helpful to have something on the wall um where they can see what happens during the day what certain things are going to happen at certain times but sometimes once it's become quite a well-established routine that's not necessarily um needed uh depending on your child really um control so i meet so many parents that talk about their child has completely taken over their household they're completely ruling the roost um everything is having to revolve ar around them and that's mainly because a child in a very unpredictable unroutined unstructured world with lots of sensory input lots of overload um, is going to do whatever they can to try and control their environment because that's the only way that they can manage their anxiety. So I always talk about a child just having a space that they can have full control over. Um, so whether that be part of their bedroom, maybe that is their whole bedroom, maybe that is um, a small uh, tent or an understand 
under stairs cupboard we've used in in the past which sounds awful like mm, I put my child in the under stairs cupboard but <laughs> it wasn't like she was ever sent there it was just a really nice closed in space where the world felt really really shut out and then um, we had some disco lights in there and uh you know some sensory calming tools and toys and things like that so just having one space that they've got full control over where they can go when they just want to shut out the world they have full control control over who comes in uh which actually is really really important because that can be quite tricky for sibling siblings and um, that they suddenly think oh well this looks good fun i want to go into that den but it has to be very much the, the child's world and whoever goes in there is is within their control and that needs to be really made quite boundaried um for that for that to be um effective i'm just going to check my notes and check i've not missed anything on any of that okay there's one thing i missed on the previous slide actually so when we talk about considerations of challenging behavior it might be good to also consider um the element of the behavior that's challenging so sometimes it's not the behavior itself but it's actually the location that the behaviors take um, happening in maybe actually that child needs to then be worked with to say okay well actually screeching that loudly um is okay but it's not okay um when you are in the park with younger children or or whatever works um whatever's appropriate there let me just cool okay so sensory differences um interestingly have only just become part of the um diagnostic criteria for um autism however it is a massive massive part of um children's lives autistic children's lives autistic adult life and it can be one of the most difficult and distressing aspects of life for um, an autistic person actually i listened to a fantastic um lady recently talk about her sensory experiences and actually she said that it was the one aspect of her autism that was really really disabling and i don't think we can really underestimate the level of distress that sensory overload and sensory sensitivities can cause children um, it's a really, really um, big area that we can really do lots and lots of work in. So it's a really good one to have a really good grasp on. And certainly having access to um, an OT that works around this sort of stuff is, is fantastic if you can um, access that sort of thing. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about sensory differences and how maybe we can support some of those. So these are our different senses, senses um vestibular proprioception um olfactory which is smell vision auditory taste touch and then interoception i'm not going to go into all of these but i am just going to touch on a couple that maybe um will take uh that i think are really really important for supporting your child so let's start with proprioception because i talk about this one a lot so um I'm not going to attempt to fully explain what the proprioception is, but it's linked to our um, body awareness and where our body is in space. And it's a really nice sense for really um, calming our child. So if you've got a child that really likes to throw themselves on the floor, that really loves the trampoline, that really loves rough and tumble, that really loves crashing themselves into the walls, then actually that that is them regulating themselves using their proprioception. Proprioception is a really lovely sense in that if you've got a really heightened child, a really anxious child or a very hyperactive child, using proprioception style exercises can really bring that child down and really um, calm that aspect of them. And if you, and equally, if you've got a child that's really sluggish, really depressed and really low, proprioception can really lift them up. So it's a really nice one and I would definitely um, advise having a little Google of proprioception. In fact, if you Google proprioception autism, um, some fantastic bits and pieces come up and some fantastic um, suggestions for exercises come up. But it's basically anything that is 
heavy impact on the body so um the trampoline is is given heavy impact every time you hit the bottom of the trampoline um it's a heavy weighted blanket it's being squished it's lifting heavy things it's pushing against walls it's playing tug of war anything that gives that the body really high input um can be fantastic and actually it's something that we use in our house particularly during lockdown we had proprioceptive activities <laughs> sounds really formal it really wasn't it was literally just bouncing on the trampoline or having a bit of a play wrestle um we would literally have them scheduled in several times throughout the day um we also use it if my daughter's a bit unsettled and she can't make decisions and she's struggling to really function and she's quite sluggish we just sort of have a bit of a jostle and a bit of a play wrestle and that can sometimes lift her enough just to really um support her in getting started with the day uh interoception i am going to talk about briefly here and then again um in a bit later but it's our internal sensations so it's those sensations that tell us that we are hungry it's those sensations that tell us that we need the toilet and that we are tired or that we are cold and we are hot so i meet many children that have got toileting issues um which are linked to interoception maybe they are not feeling the sensations that they need to go to loo and um, sometimes they don't feel those sensations until they're really quite strong which obviously means that the child's really quite desperate and maybe they are dashing to the loo but they don't try quite get there in time or maybe they are saying to the teacher i need to go to the loo and the teacher saying well you need to wait till break time um, and then they're having accidents in school so it can be a massive part of um everyday life and it can impact everyday life equally with hunger you have those children that um, become very hangry because they don't actually recognize that their body's saying to them please feed me because i'm starving um all the children that are incredibly sensitive to hunger um sensations so they they eat constantly and graze constantly because the minute that they start to feel a little bit peckish that sensation is really really strong for them and really really uncomfortable um, I work with lots of parents around um, around this and when they talk about their child being absolutely starving 10 minutes before dinner and if they don't allow their child to eat it can cause a massive meltdown even though all they're asking is for them to wait 10 minutes until dinner served and I talk then a lot about interoception and how actually if they've not recognized that they're hungry until that sensation is really 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 strong then they will actually probably feel really hangry with it because we know that actually when we're that we're that hungry we do tend to feel a bit shaky and we feel a little bit agitated but sometimes i'll say to parents do you know what offer them a reasonably healthy snack just to tide them over till dinner just to avoid that that meltdown and avoid that distress uh okay yeah so children you know the, the rest are all quite um basic really tact you know touch can be quite difficult for some children some children quite like firm touch and avoid loose touch um taste obviously impacts diets and um and food so children can be sensory seeking hyposensitive and sensory avoidant um hypersensitive they can have both avoidant and seeking profiles so that means that they can um, seek out touch but also be quite aversive to it, it it's a uh, so complex to understand because children all of this stuff changes over time it changes according to envir environment it changes according to time of the day um, and it's almost impossible to, to keep up with sometimes uh, but what's really really important I suppose to mention is that actually when your child is particularly anxious their sensitivities and their sensory seeking behaviors can become a lot more extreme so if you've got a child that's really suddenly throwing themselves around um you know a lot more extremely than normal it could be that actually they are using that to regulate themselves if you've got a child that's suddenly really really struggling with foods that they might usually tolerate um or even enjoy then it could be that actually there's something more going on and they're just not coping at all at the moment so any sensory input is really really um, overwhelming them on top of everything else okay where are we going next okay so some sensory support 
So allow and encourage stay safe stimming. So stimming behaviours are those behaviours that we see in our child that they use to regulate themselves. Now um, I've added be curious in there because actually it's really important that we keep that we we really um watch our child's our children's stimming behavior or we look at what they are doing when they are stimming because actually those are behaviors that your child has developed in order to regulate themselves so providing that they are safe and they a child is not harming themselves through those behaviors and i do see children that maybe skin pick um or scratch skin you know and it does become um uh an injury behavior um, through stimming. So as long as the stimming isn't injurious in any way, then always be curious about it and think, actually, I can see that my child's really, really loving that um, toy spinning, spinning round. So next time they're feeling a bit unsettled, maybe I could use that to help calm them. Uh, if, so there'll be, this, the thing about being curious about stimming is there'll be certain stims that a child is using to regulate themselves when they're distressed and there'll be other stimming behaviors that they are showing due to excitement so it's working out which one's which so the ones that they are using when they are excited are really fantastic the ones that they're using when they're regulating themselves we need to be aware of because if they are in an environment that is um meaning that they are using those behaviors because that environment is quite difficult then we need to remove them from that uh, so yeah, always be curious about your child's behaviour because you can actually use it as a fantastic tool to help you, to help them in other circumstances. Uh, use sensory tools, fiddles, ear defenders, proprioception, which I've already covered. Um, absolutely fantastic. Anything that you can use and just really normalise all of those things as well. If your child is in school and they're not allowed to fiddle with things, um, please please fight against that. It's really, really important that your child's got access to all of those tools in order to um, regulate themselves when things are a bit tricky or to shut out certain elements of the environment that they're finding distress in. Sorry, I've just remembered that I... Uh... Yes, use sensory tools and, and use sense, things such as ear defenders or things that protect your child from the sensory environment are really, really important to develop um, because actually your child is not just going to get used to noise. Your child isn't suddenly going to get used to eating certain foods just because um, they are forced or desensitized in any way. It just doesn't work with autistic children. So actually developing those tools with them now are really, really important because it means that they can have those tools later on in life and they can really understand that need for self-care around some of that understand the levels of distress so we've sort of touched on this already and actually the um meme here i just think explains it really really nicely um is we we have to empathize with their with their experience of sensory distress um because actually even that in itself, even just being able to say to a child, I can see that you're finding it really tricky. I can see that the noise is really bothering you instantly will make them feel less anxious. It will instantly make them feel listened to and validated. And that's really, really important. But also it means that actually if we can really um, empathize with that, we can, we can really turn around and say, do you know what? Yeah, this is, this must be horrific for you. Let's move. Let's get out of here. Um, and that's really, really important. Again, it's about teaching your child those self-care self skills that they will need um, going into adulthood and to develop some independence and to be able to uh, function uh, in a really successful way. Allow and support avoidance. So this we've sort of covered this, but so if a, a sensory stimulus is distressing, then actually it's okay to remove them from that. It's okay to know for them to know that you're not being judgmental about that and for you to normalize that and say, do you know what? This is too much. We need to move. Uh, and again, it's a really, really important one. Communication and emotional literacy. Now I do like two hour, two and a half hour webinars on this. So it's really difficult for me to try and put this into a bit of a snapshot but i've tried to do it as best i can um 
So all behaviour is a, f a form of communication. Your child is communicating something to you. Um, at the time, it might just be so overwhelming for you to manage that it's not really easy for you to be able to really work that out on the spot if you're trying to deal with a child that's highly distressed. So even if you can't be curious at the time, certainly sit down afterwards when things are calm and just have a bit of a debrief with your child if possible. But if, um, if not, just have a little bit of a debrief yourself. Think about, okay, what was going on for my child in that situation? Um, what could it have been that they were finding particularly difficult? What were they trying to tell me? Um, and if you can share this and unpick this with the child, then fantastic. Teach communication of simple emotions. Okay, so this will be particularly important. So even if your child is pre-verbal um, or has uh, a co-occurring intellectual um, disability, we should be able to teach some really basic simple emotions um, and do this using um, really concrete concrete resources. So I've just, I've got a few here that I use. So, I'll just show them to you. So sometimes children aren't able to say how they feel and we're gonna go on to the reasons why, but they might be able to point out to you how they feel. So um, when I'm doing sessions with children, um, I use these, they're basically kitchen doorknobs that I have just drawn emoji faces on. So we have various different ones. We don't name them, we just um, point to them. Some are more obvious than others I suppose if obvious is the right word and um, so I might just say to a child okay so when you were in the park today point to the face that you feel and make about maybe it's two faces maybe it's um, three faces sometimes and um, but also if your child if, if emotions are really new to your child and they're really confusing and overwhelming sometimes just something like this just really really simple tell mummy how you're feeling tell mummy tell mummy which face you were when the dog was barking uh, or whatever it is um, or it can be that sometimes a child relates better if um, they can remove themselves from the situation so um, if you think about this as one person I don't know if you can put them back to back how, how was Spoon feeling when the dog bar was barking tell me how Spoon was feeling which face did Spoon have um, when the dog was barking and just really give that nice um, concrete visual to it because that's really really um, helpful for so many children that I work with they can't describe their feelings they can't really tell you a lot about um, about what's going on for them but actually if you give them a visual like this it's amazing what they can really come up with so do definitely try really simple emotions if you go on to if you just sit literally google um, emotion emojis um emotion dinosaurs emotion lego men i've got ones that have got lego men on them so you can really use your child's interest to engage them if you've got a child that absolutely loves minecraft then you'll be able to find minecraft ones um, and then you might be able to just print them off and laminate them so you've got a visual or maybe stick them to some wooden spoons um, anything that's tactile is really nice if a child can play and touch it then that's always really nice as well and quite engaging so it's a really good tool to try and use with your child. Um, they won't be able to use these in a meltdown, by the way. Um, this will be more about a debrief and a more about catching your child before they get to that meltdown stage. Maybe you can use something like this when you're talking about a trip out and you're breaking that trip down as to which bits of their fight they're gonna find most tricky. Model, label, accept and empathize. So um, I'd really um, advise that you look at Pace Parrington, um, which will explain in a lot more depth um, the accept and empathize part. So P-A-C-E, um, a lot of it's done by Dan Siegel, I believe. I might have that wrong. I'm pretty sure it's Dan Siegel. Um, but just accepting your child's emotions and empathizing with them can be really, really um, nurturing in itself. But if you've got a child that really doesn't understand their own emotions and modeling and labeling can be really 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 helpful so talking about your own emotions so oh mummy's been feeling really like this today because it, i've had a really long day at work or 
um, somebody said something that was unkind to me. And again, don't like share your deepest, darkest worries with your children, but certainly talk about how you feel, what made you feel that way. Um, so that it's almost like uh, drip feeding, uh, just a bit of information around emotions that a child can pick up on. Um, in the same way that we teach a child language, we need to do similar things with emotions and emotional language. So, you know, mummy's had a really difficult day at work today. I'm just going to sit down and just sit in front of the TV and give you a bit of a cuddle because that always makes me feel better. Or I'm going to sit and have a cup of coffee because that always makes me feel better. Label emotions for children. Now, again, don't do this when they're about to hit breaking point, but certainly afterwards you can say, mum could see that you were starting to feel a little bit or a little bit or a little bit angry or a little bit sad or um labeling those emotions can really be helpful one sort of note of caution is that if your child is completely confused by emotions and lots of children i work with are just even having these conversations could be really really difficult for them so just be aware that actually there's a lot of confusion um, around this. So you might have to start off really quite gently and just be talking about emotions in relation to other people and not necessarily about the child themselves. How are we doing for time? I think we're doing good. Okay, so alexithymia is um, particularly common in autistic people. I think it's something like, I want to say 50% but I think it's higher so um, alexithymia is a separate condition it can occur with or without autism and I again it's one of those things just have a really good google about it um because I'll explain it really really briefly but there's lots more um around alexithymia and Dr Jeff Bird um, at Oxford University in particular is doing some amazing research into alexithymia so what it is is um, I, I always break it down into three parts. So alexithymia consists of not necessarily um, getting the senses of your emotions. So how we talked about interoception, our sense, um, our emotions also give us internal sensations. So when we start to feel a little bit nervous, we might start to feel a bit sick or we might feel like we need the loo or we might feel like um, we've got butterflies. Um, so some children, because of interoception and because of alexithymia, won't get those signals that something's not quite right. So that's the first part of alexithymia, not actually feeling the internal signals. The second one is that maybe they do um, feel those internal signals, but maybe they're not able to, to um, express them or communicate them or understand them and then the third part is that actually they they feel them they understand them but they can't communicate them in a way that means that they can access support or help so it's quite big it's quite a big thing because if you can put yourself in the shoes of a child who has interoception difficulties and alexithymia and um, they don't recognize any of the build-up of their emotions they don't um, understand the sensations within them and then suddenly they just blow suddenly out of nowhere they just have a ginormous meltdown they didn't feel the build-up they didn't feel um they didn't understand it enough to say oh my god i need I, I need to stop i need to get out of this place um particularly if they've got communication difficulties all of a sudden they're in a really scary emotional state and there's nothing they can do about it that's a really, really frightening place to be. And I actually work with a, a teenager who's um, autistic and has alexithymia. And he just is so anxious because he just never knows what his emotions are going to throw at him because he just doesn't feel anything. He doesn't feel anything enough to be able to get help before, um, before it all just goes so horribly wrong. So just something to be really aware of um, that it's really frightening and emotions are really big and scary when you don't have the I mean they're big and scary if, you know at the best of times but particularly if you don't have the understanding and the communication skills to really share them with somebody and really seek help so this is why we get the zero to a hundred in a split second which loads of parents say to me he was fine well he's fine one second the next me, me, the next minute he just had a massive meltdown um, and this this is all linked. Uh, alexithymia, interoception, volcano effect. So they don't necessarily recognise that build up of that accumulative stress throughout the day, and then you just get this massive eruption. 
And another thing to mention around emotions is hypersensitivity. So, so many children I work with are so hypersensitive to the emotions of people around them. So, um, this can be quite a difficult one to manage if you're um, particularly anxious yourself as a parent and you're trying to regulate your child. Your child will instantly know that you are also feeling a bit unsafe and a bit wobbly and a bit scared. Um, so, just really to be aware actually even though i mean your child may show their hypersensitivity to your emotions or other people's emotions but maybe they don't um but maybe it's there and it's just not expressed it could also in be sometimes people's hypersensitivity hyper i should say hypersensitivity to emotions can be actually um, misunderstood as something else so for example um a child that's really distressed by a baby crying could actually be more about the fact that that child is high rather than this the noise of a child crying that we would assume is causing the distress it could be that actually your child feels the distress of that child um of that baby and they feel that upset so i mean i meet a lot of autistic um, adults that talk really well about this about how actually they feed from other people's emotions and they take on that emotion and how difficult that is to manage so if your child is struggling with the emotions around them and they take that on sometimes they will avoid other people's difficult emotions because actually they know that this going to they're going to find that really distressing and really overwhelming just something to be aware of if you do see a bit of sensitivity to others emotions in your child um and yeah this I, I love this meme it just sort of explains a little bit more um about the alexithymia um and again it's just really insightful okay so we're going to talk a bit about meltdowns um so meltdowns are those really really big explosions of emotion they are probably one of the most challenging um aspects um as a parent trying to support a child trying to the energy that goes into trying to prevent a meltdown trying to manage a meltdown safely and trying to then re recover from a meltdown i know it can be really really um difficult and really exhausting as it is for the child that's also um, having the meltdown. So it's always a good one to cover. So they're just an intense response to becoming overwhelmed. So I'm not gonna talk too much about how the brain works, but basically a meltdown is um, a, a, a response in the brain. And actually there's a fantastic video by Dan Siegel. It's on YouTube. Um, I think Stephanie's going to take a note of this for you. So Dan Siegel is on YouTube and it's called Why We Lose Control of Our Emotions. It's aimed at, te at teenagers actually, but I always send it to parents because it uses some really nice, simple, basic language that actually, if you've got a child that's got a level of um, ability to understand some of this, then actually it's a really nice one to either share with your child or for you to be able to take the language from and um, be able to talk it through with your child. So it's Dan Siegel, Why We Lose Control of Our Emotions, and it's on um, YouTube. So he just talks a little bit about the upstairs brain, the downstairs brain, um, and how the part of our brain that is there to keep us safe is very easily triggered um, in autistic children. So it's, very, it's a very sensitive part of the brain. But I always speak to say to parents, actually, when you're seeing a meltdown um, or a shutdown, which is where a child just really becomes very inward can go quite glazed quite blank and quite often can go mute and um, so the very internalized version of a meltdown um when your child is in that i completely lost my train of thought then when your child is in that meltdown mode i always say to parents reframe it as your child having a panic attack your child is having a pan panic attack because the, the epicenter of the brain that is there to that is there to keep us safe so it is there to control our anxiety and all of our emotions is triggered and something in that brain is something that's happened is telling your child they are not safe and they are at risk of, of significant harm so they are having a massive panic attack 
And if we can reframe a meltdown as a panic attack, I think it can really change how we then respond. How would you respond to a to a, to an adult having a, or anybody having a panic attack? Um, you know, you would stay calm, you would stay quiet, you would stay reassuring. And that's a really important one to, to try and do um, during a child's meltdown. They're not a form of manipulation or man naughty behavior. And that's a really important one to remember. They're, um, they're not in control of their behavior. However, we do know, and I know this from experience of my own child, that sometimes there are elements of it that it almost seems like they're in control. Um, particularly maybe if they target certain people, but actually there is a massive element of not having any control. And um, a really, really good, again, a really, really good YouTube video comes from Joe James. He's an autistic adult. He's got, um, he's autistic and um, ADHD. And he talks about, he explains a meltdown um, and he does this amazing analogy. And I definitely um, advise you to have a good, have a good watch of it so it's called it's joe james um and it's called explanation of a meltdown or something along those lines he's got a youtube channel you'll definitely find it on there i think he's got a few versions of it on there actually and it really talks about that lack of control and not being able to put the brakes on and you can see all of these things going on around you and you know that you're doing them but actually you just cannot put the brakes on it it's a really brilliant analogy so definitely have a have a look at that um, meltdowns, as we know, can be triggered by a wide range of things. Anxiety, change of routine, again, all of these massively overlap. Accumulative stress, um, I like to talk about because, again, it's, it's that Coke bottle analogy. It's that volcano analogy where throughout the day, your child gets just um, a tiny bit triggered, a tiny bit shaken up. And, um, and then all of a sudden, they seem to blow over the smallest thing. And you're like, oh, I'd like you just blew over the fact that the um the tv got paused or something really you know you seems quite insignificant but sometimes it's the straw that broke the camel's back um and i know i wrote some notes about this yeah now i've covered them all um so that's really really important to remember also another thing to remember is that sometimes um a meltdown can be um it can, it can be a delayed effect of something that's happened previously. So if you've had a really big long day out and you've um, been in a really busy environment, sometimes the next day can be particularly difficult for a child and then you see this risk of meltdown and it's like, it's, it's what we call a social hangover where it just takes a little bit longer for everything to be processed. And um, so it's always a good one to be aware that it might not necessarily be something that's happened then. It might be something that's happened a day, a, a day ago, two days ago, and that unpicking can be really, really tricky. Um, and meltdowns can be physical, verbal aggression, or can be shutdowns, um, as I've discussed. Memory loss can occur, and this is this is um, one that's quite important to remember. I worked with a lad who, um, during a meltdown, smashed the um, family's very expensive new TV. And um, after he'd uh, after he'd re-regulated and calmed, he he sort of said, well, "What happened to the TV?" And of course, that really triggered Dad, who was like, "You know, if all well, what happened to the TV?" Um, and I had to speak, talk to Dad about actually the brain um, mechanisms and how memory loss can occur because what happens when all of our adrenaline, our blood flow, goes to that lower part of the brain? the um, upper more sophisticated part of the brain where memories are made is, isn't really getting much blood flow. So it, sometimes there can be a level of memory loss that occurs um, with a meltdown. Okay, so negative cycle of a meltdown. Um, I talk about this quite a lot because actually I work with a lot of children who've got really, really poor self-esteem and that can be quite difficult. Um, and it can trigger more anxiety and a higher risk of meltdowns. And sometimes um, we're a little bit guilty of being part of this cycle um, as parents, but also, you know, in schools as well. So anxiety, you know, our child is anxious, our child um, is overwhelmed, um, and then 
they are triggered their brain is triggered into a stress response so that can be fight or flight that can be um, you know a stress response is a meltdown or can be a meltdown um, so when our child is in meltdown and they kick and they scream and they throw abuse and you know these can go on for a period of time it's it's not unusual to for parents to try the tactic of right that's it I'm removing your iPad right that's it you need to say sorry um, you know throwing all the all of these um, punishments and consequences um, at this child so that's what we call our adult imposed consequences now I'd say without exception, every single child that I work with, and maybe they don't always admit it to their parents, but every single child I work with feels horrific about their meltdowns. They know that hitting, shouting, screaming, throwing abuse at their parents, breaking things, it's not okay. They know that that's not an okay behaviour. Um, so they come out of it feeling a bit like, well, I did all of those really awful things and I didn't have control over it and I couldn't stop myself. And now I'm calm again. I'm really upset because I did all those terrible things. So I must be a really horrifically bad person. And my parents must think I'm a really, really bad person too, because they've punished me and they've told me that now I can't have my iPad or, um, or, you know, or whatever. So it just adds to that child's poor self-esteem. Um, and that in turn then triggers more anxiety, which means that they're less likely to be triggered into a meltdown. Now I get as a parent that it goes against all instincts sometimes to accept the behavior as a sign of distress, to accept the behavior as a panic attack. Um, and I know many parents that have been in a position where they've tried various different tactics, but I do think it's really important to try and reframe some of this um, and to really look at this and see if there's anywhere that we can break the cycle and to be able to, to, to be able to reassure our child that actually this isn't you, this is your brain taking over. Um, you are not a bad person this is just that actually you're a really you're a really sensitive good person and that means that sometimes your brain is easily triggered um, and that can be quite a difficult one sometimes our children aren't um haven't got the ability to, to understand that but we can certainly do something about the adults adult imposed consequences we can certainly replace that with nurture and care um to try and break that cycle a little bit So supporting a child in meltdown, now this is really tricky. Every child's so, so different. Um, so there's never any like hard and fast processes to follow when it comes to um, supporting a child in meltdown. But certainly if there's a particularly distressing stimuli, a distressing environment, an overwhelming environment that you're in, removing them from that is really, really important in, in, in sort of removing the world as much as you can from around them and taking them to a safe, calm place or environment remain calm and non-judgmental i know that's easier said than done if you could tag team supporting a child in meltdown with um, another adult then that's really fantastic so at the point where you can feel yourself becoming triggered which can happen uh, and does happen because we're only human and sometimes our brains are triggered too um sometimes being able to tag team with another adult for them to recognize that you're starting you're starting to become heightened and being able to um swap over then that can be really really helpful um keep others safe so yeah it does mean sometimes having to remove other people from the room um putting putting siblings or other people into us an, into to somewhere else in the house where they can be safe um, avoiding physical contact, but this is just really vary on the child. Um, but yeah, unless a firm hug will come and they will accept, but otherwise do try to avoid any physical contact um, because that can actually really escalate things if touch is particularly difficult for that child um, or suddenly they feel like you're going to try and physically control them. Don't ask questions or place demands. Um, that part of the brain that is able to listen and use logic and to be able to follow instructions isn't getting any blood flow so um, it's actually just going to stress the child out even more because they, they can't take that in they can't process that 
and don't discipline which is really linked to that anxiety cycle that we've talked about the do's are a lot more difficult because it really does vary for each individual child and it doesn't vary according to which environment you know what environment you're in but keeping keeping your child safe um and trying to do as much as many of these as possible um can really help oh we finished almost on time so i just always add this in at the end of my webinars um particularly at the moment during lockdown when we've got highly anxious children their routines are completely thrown out um their you know some for some of them school is a real um safe place for them and they're not able to access that um so sometimes there's things that are outside of our control sometimes there's inevitable um inevitable meltdowns that are there because of everything else that's going on so i just Feel like it's always important to say to parents do you know what sometimes meltdowns happen sometimes behaviors are there and sometimes all we can really do is just nurture through it and that actually you you are your child's safe person so just to be there and to let them know that that you are still there and it's okay and um is is what the best that we can do um until things can you know stuff that isn't that is outside of our control starts to calm down a little bit um so just a few to to wrap up as best as i can because i do tend to go off a little bit just a few key takeaways reduce anxiety using predictability visual communication visual timetables um you know plan plan ahead uh calendars visual visual calendars at home as to what's going to be happening when who's going to be involved in that what you're going to be having for dinner can sometimes be a nice one to for it to be quite predictable um manage anxiety using sensory supports stimming behaviors environmental adjustments um, and breaking that negative anxiety cycle that we spoke about and improving emotional literacy and communication so that's yours and your child so being curious about your child's um behaviors will improve your um understanding and emotional and their emo your understanding of their emotions labeling debriefing um so really using that calm time to unpick things with your child and um, talking through their day leading up to the challenging behavior using your 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 happy sad visuals to really work out what was going on for them at each stage and i think that brings us to the end